his son, and of course Cecil's nephew. And this is going to be very difficult for me, and I hope if I quit singing that you will just continue on. I certainly would appreciate it. We'll have congregational singing up until about 2 o'clock, which time we'll begin the regular services. If you would please take a songbook and turn to 280.
this afternoon to Ruby and the children, Donald, Mike, and Sheila, in the loss of their loved one. Hundreds of people are here to share your grief upon this occasion. Forty years ago yesterday, it had been October the 15th, I began a gospel meeting with a church in Poplar Bluff, Missouri, and continued that meeting through three Lord's Days, 15 through 29, and uh, for the first time met and enjoyed uh, Ruby and Cecil. I visited in their home, spent part of a Lord's Day in their home. Oris and his wife came, Lawrence and his wife came, and we enjoyed a lot of singing upon that afternoon. And one thing, if Ruby will permit me to tell it, and I'm sure she will, as we drove to the service that night, Cecil and Ruby rode in the car with me. I don't know what I said, but uh, Ruby said, well, Brother Goo, it just seems like we've been married all our lives. <laughs> I shall never forget the, that rather interesting statement. And then on the 10th day of August of 1947, I came from Charleston, Missouri, out to Maynard, Arkansas, for the funeral of Lawrence Wilson, the brother, and whose son is leading the singing. And then on the last day of May of 1949, I moved my family to Pocahontas, Arkansas, and began to work with Tyburn Street. And early in 1950, I taught a weekly Bible class every Monday night for preachers and others. And at the conclusion of that series, the members of the class presented me with a beautiful volume, deluxe volume, of Young's Analytical Concordance. And from that day until today, I have used that with a great deal of pleasure. 
I thought it might be of interest to go back uh, nearly 35 years and tell this large audience who made up that flag. G.W. Allison, Harvey Allison, Shirley Allison, Billy Joe Bridges, Laurel Blassingame, Chester Bard, Earl Chester, N.E. Honeycutt, Riley Henry, A.A. A. Robinson, and Cecil Wilson. Those are the, are the brethren who made up that class, and their names are written in this Young's Analytical Concordant by the hand of Riley Henry. Now, through the years, throughout the years, I have encouraged Cecil in his work as a gospel preacher, and one thing about him I appreciated was his determination as a minister. I actually have seen him in the pulpit when he should have been in bed if he had done justice to himself, but he wanted to be where he was needed, and he wanted to serve, and he wanted to help. And he wanted to be of assistance to anybody who needed his assistance. His attitude toward his work reminds me of a few lines written under the title, Never Give Up. One ship goes east and another west by the self-same winds that blow. Tis a set of the sail and not the gale that determines the way they go. And like the waves of the sea are the waves of faith, as we voyage along through life, tis a set of the soul that determines the goal, and not the calm or the strife. And it was a set of his soul that determined his goal, and he never did give up. His attitude toward his work reminds me of a statement in the book of Luke, chapter 9 and verse uh, 51. And it has to do with our Savior. He set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem, and he went and was not diverted nor deterred in his de determination. Now I'm going to read the obituary written, I believe, by Mike. Joseph Cecil Wilson, longtime resident of Randolph County, businessman, cattleman, and minister, was pronounced dead at the Randolph County Memorial Hospital, Pocahontas, Arkansas, on Sunday morning, October the 14th, 1984. He had apparently suffered a massive heart attack at his home late Saturday night. In 1959, he suffered his first attack and endured many more until the last. Although he had serious heart trouble for a quarter of a century, he did not allow that to flag his zeal for what he believed and wanted to accomplish. Cecil Wilson was the last remaining survivor of the Lewis M. Wilson family of the Brakeville community in northern Randolph County. Born in Brakeville community, he was reared on a farm by parents who were dedicated members of the Church of Christ. His grandfather, Johnny Wilson, was instrumental in helping to establish the Brakeville Church. Uncle Johnny's children, one of whom was Lewis Wilson, Cecil's father, were leaders in the church at Brakeville and every place they went. Lewis Wilson married Evelyn Mark on October the 4th 1906. To this union were born six children, five boys and one girl. Cecil was the last surviving member of the family. The Wilson family was known far and wide for their beautiful singing and effective preaching and teaching. The talented boys were often called to sing for funeral, church services, special song services, and other gatherings throughout the year. Oris, Lawrence, and Cecil were also called upon to preach sermons and teach classes for churches in northeast Arkansas and southeast Missouri. 
untimely death took Lawrence and Horace Wilson and their sister Lola. Shira Lee died when he was six years old and Reuben Ray when he was but ten days old. Cecil was the last survivor, long survivor rather, as his father and mother died in 1963 and 1965 respectively. On June 6, 1937, Cecil married Ruby Louise Shaver, youngest daughter of Luther and Dora Shaver of the Palestine community. The Shavers were responsible for helping to establish the Palestine Church of Christ and had been an influence for the restoration movement in Randolph County since before the Civil War. With the help and encouragement of his beloved wife, Cecil worked and studied hard through the years to become a leading citizen of the community and a preacher of the gospel of Christ. After World War II, Cecil attended and completed horology training at Montgomery and Taylor School of Watchmaking in Poplar Bluff, Missouri. In 1947, he moved back to his home county where he subsequently founded Wilson Jewelry in Pocahontas in 1950. During the next 34 years, he served his community as a leader and member of the Kiwanis Club, the City Council, the Chamber of Commerce, and as part of many other charitable and uh, civic organizations. As a minister, he served people and churches throughout the area. He was immersed by L.W. Henson in 1931 and lived true to his confession until death. Early on, he was encouraged to preach by Uncle Bert Shaver of Pocahontas and Harvard D. Hooker of Poplar Bluff. He attended intensive Bible training classes taught by Frank W. Goo of Pocahontas. His chief aim was to help small and struggling churches to grow and to teach people the way of the Lord. His first regular preaching responsibility was undertaken at Mangrum and Hackberry Churches of Christ near Caraway, Arkansas. After working nine or ten hours every day, six days each week, he would load his family into the car and drive the 70 or 80 miles to churches every Sunday. He was influential in immersing many people and helping those rural churches experience unparalleled growth. After a couple of years, he was invited to help the Donovan, Missouri Church. He accepted and continued preaching there for a couple of years. However, the church enjoyed remarkable growth, and many people were immersed. He subsequently preached for many congregations throughout the area for various lengths of time. His popularity as a minister was so great that he was called upon to preach in meetings far and near, conduct funerals and weddings for people of every religious persuasion, speak at school, baccalaureate, homecomings, and do local and full-time preaching work. He never turned down any opportunity to help or assist someone or some church in need. It was not his desire, however, to do full-time located church work. He believed that he could be more effective as a vocational preacher, and the years of fruitful service proved him to be right. It would be rare indeed for any located minister to have done more than he did. When anyone needed him, he would turn out the lights and lock the door of the jewelry store and help however he could. Perhaps his greatest strength was in his uncanny ability to comfort the bereaved in times of immense suffering due to the loss of loved ones. He could say the right words and do the right thing calculated to alleviate the sorrows and suffering as much as humanly possible. During his more than 34 years of ministerial work, he conducted upward of 5,000 funeral services. 
I'm sure it would be right and proper and accurate to say that he conducted more funeral services than all of the other preachers combined. I'm sure that's true. On the day before his death, he had comforted a bereaved family and helped them plan for a funeral. The same day, he performed a wedding ceremony for a young couple. He enjoyed helping people begin their lives together and conducted thousands of weddings to this end. This legacy lives on in his beloved wife of nearly 50 years, three children, seven grandchildren, and an innumerable host of family and friends. Although the mortal coil of Cecil Wilson is no longer with us, his spirit and influence will be remembered and live on forever. Written by Michael L. Wilson, the son. Now by request, some lines from Mr. Tennyson. Sunset and evening star, and one clear call for me. And may there be no morning at the bar when I put out to sea. For such a tide is moving, seems asleep, too full for sound and poem. For that which drew from out the boundless deep turns again home. Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark. May there be no sadness of farewell when I embark. For though from out our bond of time and place the flood may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face when I have crossed the bar. And the final words in my part of the survey addressed to Cecil, Soldier, rest thy warfare o'er. Sleep the sleep that knows no breaking. Dream of battlefields no more. Morn of toil or night of waking. Associated with Cecil and Ruby, 
through the years from the very day that we began our effort in preaching the gospel of Christ. If ever a man in this world that ever loved and respected me, I felt Cecil did. I do believe with all of my heart that he was a master in his feet. I have attended many funerals, assisted many people, heard many sermons preached to comfort those in whom that are left behind. And I can truthfully say that I have never heard a man that could out-excel Cecil in that effort. As Brother Gould stated in the reading of his life, Cecil always had the proper and correct expression to make. He has been with me and my family in our grief on both sides, both with the wife and my family. Cecil preached the message to my father and mother, my father-in-law. We appreciate that in Cecil. He was the choice of the family. And certainly Cecil always came and helped in whatever way he could. Cecil was as myself. We longed to hear and learn all we could about the Bible. I'm sure Cecil's attitude uh, along the line was equal to mine. When I began to preach the gospel of Christ, I did never mean to be turned from that effort. I'm sure that Cecil meant the same. He meant to preach it till he died. As far as I'm concerned, people ask me about retirement. That's out of my vocabulary. There's no place for a gospel preacher to retire. As long as lays in our power to, to express the truth, I believe God requires that office. So that we can quit preaching the gospel, and Cecil meant to preach it until he died, and he did. Each one of us have our ability. Cecil had his. If you doubt this, all we'd have to read is the apostles of our Lord. Each one were different. Each one had an ability the other man did not have. I know that there are stronger men doctrinally than was Cecil. There are men in whom that would defend the truth at the drop of a hat, but Cecil rather comfort. We have the same attitude of the Apostle Paul and the Apostle John. Paul was ready to go to battle any minute. John was always eager to comfort in whatever way he could. We have that attitude of men. We can't be one another. I could not do nor serve in the capacity that Cecil did to save my soul. And I do not believe he could fulfill mine efforts. Because he is Cecil, I am Arthur. Each one of us are individual. Cecil and I began our work and we conducted a little meeting up here in old Hamill, Arkansas. First one was ever we ever tried. I would lead the singing for Cecil. He'd preach that night. Next night, Cecil would lead for me. We went on and we agreed where we would divide up our support whatever that support was. And I will tell you people something, how that we began the preaching, the kind of support we got. We preached there for ten nights. And when our pay came and we got the support, we got, and we was to hook up the electric bill, and, and we were to pay that when it was over. Well, then we would divide up what we had left. And when Cecil and me finished that meeting, this was our first effort, but we were glad of it, and it was a great uh, effort on our part and a great benefit to each of us. I've always cherished it, and I'm sure Cecil did to the day he breathed his last breath. But our support was $4.90. 
The electric bill was four dollars and eighty cents. And I went down and I said, See, sir, you pay the electric bill. No, I said, said you go pay it. I said, All right. Our agreement was we were to divide the support. Well, I went and paid the electric bill, and when I paid that electric bill, I came over to his jewelry store, and I said, See, sir, we were going to divide up our support. I said, I've got a dime left. You can have a nickel of it. <laughs> I, and you know, Cecil cherished that through his life. But how many men today would go out and really preach the truth of God because I love the truth? We preached it out of conviction. I still do. Man will never buy my faith. And I'm certain of the fact that they can never buy Cecil's. You know, we started to preach the gospel to the end. And I pray that I shall come to the end of my way as faithful to the truth as Cecil came to the end of his day. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the young evangelist Timothy, stated in chapter 4 of the second letter, the King James says, I am now ready to be offered. The American standard on that verse says, I am now being offered. In the process of being at that time, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Could I comment just a moment on what that really means? I have fought a good fight. I stood against opposition of the truth. I have found the right. I have kept the faith. I have kept the gospel. I have maintained it, and now I have finished my race, I have come to the end of the course, and the crown is to be granted me. And he said, this crown that is given to me, not only to me, but unto all of them also, that love is appearing. That to me is the greatest victory that a soldier can ever win. Many of us have served in the armed forces. We know that when the battle was fought, the victory was won. Then the time came that we stacked arms. We laid the weapon aside. No longer do we have to use them. You know, Cecil has stacked the arms. The battle's already been fought. And now he is awaiting that reward that will be granted him. And he believed that reward to be true, and the Lord true to his promise. As Paul said, it's not only to me, but unto all of them also the love is appearing. I have a little poem that I would like to just read to you as a family. To me, it's one of the greatest ones that I've ever heard or ever read in my life. And that is how to remember. We want to remember Cecil for what he was, what he did, what he stood for, and what he really was in life. When our life on earth is ended and our spirits flee away, and our hope of life eternal leads to that bright and happy day. May our lives be lived to brighten others on the sea of time, as was lived by this loved one, just to make our lives sublime. All of you who knew this loved one will remember deeds of love which he did while living with you that your journey up above may be brighter as you travel on the road of life below to attain those heavenly mansions ever free of earthly woe. The only way to keep in memory all the good that he had done is to live a life of service, win a crown as he has won. That your soul be saved in glory, and you'll meet him there someday, and enjoy a glad reunion 
that will never pass away. That's written by Brother Clarence Gilbert, Gospel Preacher. Great poem in expressing what life is and what we expect. Will you bow your head with me as we go to our Father in prayer? Our loving Father in heaven, as we come to thee, we want to thank thee for having known and been associated with this one in whom that has passed into thy care, knowing that his soul is resting in that alien realm to await and abide that judgment day, when some day, then at that time, his soul be reunited to this body in a glorified state to live and to dwell with thee throughout eternity. Our Father, we pray thy blessings upon the wife, the swan, the sons, the daughter, and the grandchildren. We pray, our Father, that they may ever cherish the life that this husband, this father, and grandfather has set before them, that they will ever walk in his death. We pray for them to always be faithful to thee and never become weary in well-doing to do those things that thou hast ascribed in thy word to be done. And to you that are friends of Cecil this day that are present, we pray God's blessings to be with each one, and may his life ever be true and dear to you and to me, believing that someday we shall meet again on laps of the shore when we shall face thee at the judgment seat. Go with us, our Father, throughout this day and throughout the remaining service. In Christ's name we humbly pray. Amen. Oh, we came for some.